Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the first in the series of lectures, the Information Management Lectures for this fall. Uh, my name is Bertram McDonald, I'm a faculty member with the School of Information Management, and I'm coordinating this series this year, so I'm very pleased that you are here. Uh, so we'll hear more about the speaker in a moment, and of course we'll hear the lecture in a moment. Uh, but today is actually a very significant anniversary. And I'm not sure that any of you are familiar or aware that today uh, is very significant and this book is very significant. So let me say a little bit about it, because it really does uh, lend itself to uh, uh, having some attention drawn to it. The date was September 1962, 50 years ago. Uh, three excerpts of the book about to be published had already appeared in the New Yorker that summer and great interest and anticipation was growing in the public and in government departments responsible for agriculture, wildlife conservation and water and food quality. The American President John Kennedy, already a reader of the author's previous best-selling books on these seas, was interested in seeing some action taken immediately by his officials. Angst was felt by the chemical industry and rebuttals and lawsuits were being planned. The author was being both celebrated as a visionary and hero and attacked as a crackpot and a subversive woman with an axe to grind. The book was Silent Spring, which you see the cover there. And the author was Rachel Carson. Uh, it was published by Houghton uh, Mifflin in Boston and it was officially released 50 years ago today. The book was a heartfelt, brilliantly researched and wonderfully written uh, expose of the impacts of pesticides and other toxic chemicals on the environment and its wildlife. It became an instant bestseller and was selected by the Book of the Month Club for a cover in that year. Silent Spring is still in press. Uh, it sold over two million copies in countless languages worldwide and is considered one of the most significant books of the 20th century. And so here is a, a more recent edition than the one that was published in 1962. And uh, there has been the subject of many books itself, uh, notably Linda Lear's Rachel Carson, uh, Witness for Nature. Silent Spring led to discussion and debate about chemicals that resulted in new environmental legislation, new government departments. For example, in this country, the Department of the Environment was established shortly thereafter. And most importantly, a new public awareness of the health and environmental risks of living in a chemically dependent society. Well, why celebrate this anniversary this month? Does Silent Spring have any lessons for us? Is it still worth reading? Well, the answer, of course, lies with every reader and whatever perspective you might want to take with that. But the view of many in conservation and the environmental sciences is that Silent Spring is a landmark in our collective efforts to care for the environment and it deserves revisiting. Its basic message that chemicals can both harm uh, can harm both wildlife and ourselves if not tested adequately before use and mishandled during use is certainly still valid today. The book's description of ecological processes was an early, accurate and eloquent attempt to describe ecology in a readily understood way. The book and its author have become icons in the struggle to protect and conserve natural environments and in the, pro in the, and, sorry, and in the process protect human health from exposures to persistent and toxic chemicals. Carson's book, though it is dated in places, is as beautifully written as her other classics. It's definitely worth reading. It's certainly worth celebrating. She was a dedicated woman. At the time, she was struggling with cancer that uh, killed her less than two years later. And it certainly is a literary masterpiece that has inspired a generation of scientists and environmentalists. So indeed, there is reason to take note of this book, uh, read it, or reread it if you have already done so, uh, and celebrate this anniversary and the primary message, because the message is still very relevant for us today. Now, these were words that were written by one of my colleagues, uh, research colleagues, Peter Wells. He had hoped to be here to actually tell you a bit about this, as he's a bit passionate about this book, and uh, for good reason. Uh, but since it is 50 years ago today, then I think it is uh, definitely worth our uh, celebrating. So that's another gem that you're getting here tonight that you weren't anticipating, I'm sure. <laughs> 
Okay, so it's now my uh, pleasure to turn the matter of the uh, primary matter of this evening uh, to the lecture that we're going to hear in a moment. Uh, I do want to draw your attention just before um, uh, Alan Charney comes, or Tony comes to introduce our speaker, uh, to draw your attention to the subsequent lectures in the series this fall. Uh, there are flyers here you can take away so you can remind yourself about uh, these lectures. Uh, the next one will be on uh, Friday, the 19th of October. Uh, and Dr. Lisa Lynch from the Department of Journalism at Concordia University will be here to talk about the leak, the leak heard around the world, Cablegate, WikiLeaks, and the evolving global mediascape. So all of the lectures that are happening this fall are very relevant. Uh, yesterday's paper in Halifax has an article about serendipity, so uh, you've arrived in the right place at the right time. So maybe that's serendipitous itself. I'm now going to ask Alan Shorey, uh, co-chair of the uh, Student Association, to introduce our speaker. Welcome. Uh, tonight I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Annabelle Kleinhasi, an associate professor at the Faculty of Information and Media Studies at, and the Department of Sociology at the University of Western Ontario. She holds a Master of Science in Psychology from Humboldt University, Berlin, and received her PhD in Information Studies from the University of Toronto. Dr. Konhatsi is going to talk with us about tonight about the ways in which we encounter information, and while that may seem like a straightforward topic, it's not. <laughs> Tonight's focus will be on the fact that not all the, that not all of the information people encounter is through goal-oriented goal search, but rather that information is often found accidentally and purpose, purposefully and without purposefully looking. Dr. Konhatsi's research interests lie in how factors such as serendipity insight and work routine are changing through the use of digital tools. She currently holds an insight grant from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada to study serendipity in digital, digital environments in the humanities. Dr. Konhasi is a prolific writer having authored two books, Information Brokering in High Tech Industry, Online Social Networks at Work, as well as Technology and Society, Inequality, Power and Social Networks. In addition, she has written over 40 articles, book chapters, and conference proceedings. Please join in, please join in welcoming Dr. Konhasi to speak about serendipity, serendipity models, how we encounter information in people in digital environments. Thank you so much, um, Alan, for, for the introduction. I really do appreciate that. Um, so today as we were walking around um, Halifax, it was a beautiful sunny day, and we found this little store that I'm sure many of you are aware of. So I had to take a picture there, and I sort of thought, well, is that serendipity or not? Um, I don't know. So that's something that I want to really address today. It's just, you know, when is it serendipity, when is it not? And I think that those are you know, things that we're trying to find out both at a very theoretical and as well as a, an empirical level. Um, let's see. Okay, great. So to start with, it is indeed a great pleasure to be here today at the Faculty of Management, Dalhousie University. Um, and I would really like to start by thanking Drs. Bertrand MacDonald and Anatoly Grusk for, for this invitation. Um, it is really a, a pleasure for me um, to be here today. And I think we're all really excited about Influence 12. Um, we've been tweeting about it now for months and you know, getting our posters ready. So uh, I hope that, you know, I, I, I think it's going to be a great event. Um, and with all the social um, you know, events that are planned around it, uh, it sh promises to be great. So the topic of today's talk is broadly, uh, as Alan said, um, information search, uh, and particularly the um, phenomenon of uh, serendipity. So generally speaking, the presentation goes well beyond a single paper. So I'm not going to discuss one study here, but I'm going to try and cover rather an emerging field of research, and I'm going to try to convince you of its relevance. 
So the three goals then are first, to provide an overview of the current debate around the phenomenon of serendipity, introduce some of the key models, compare and contrast them, and, and reach some conclusions based on that analysis. Um, second, to discuss how technology has affected the process of information search, and in particularly the phenomenon of uh, serendipity. And then finally, I'd like to present some of the current research that we've been doing at the lab, at Socio Digital Lab. Um, and th this section is still a little bit broad and unconclusive because here, this is just the beginning of our five year SHRC insight grant, so we don't have really yet many results. So it will be more on a theoretical and conceptual level that um, things uh, will be discussed. So much of the research on how we encounter information tends to focus on linear models of intentional information search. Here, information seeking is propulsive and goal-driven. Um, according to Wilson, information seeking occurs when we're actively seeking information as a consequence of a need of some kind of a goal. So these models in general are based on cognitive science um, and the idea here is that there's a problem that we're trying to solve and as we deal with that problem, we encounter a gap, we go out, seek out information, and then bring that information back to, to bridge um, that gap. Now, I'd like to say that um, while you know, search expansion or, or the examination of research resources is a part of those models, um, generally speaking, those models only tend to focus on that in a very limited kind of way. So the models in general, even though they may include expansion, exploration, discovery, is not really at the center um, of, of these models. So here, this is an example of one of the models by Brandon Gruvel, 2009, and uh, most of you are probably familiar with a number of these models, so I don't really need to, to, to go through them. So recently a number of studies and frameworks have suggested that not all information individuals encounter is through goal-oriented search, but rather that individuals often find information and connect with people accidentally without purposefully looking. So to quote Erdelis here, 2004, she says, research-driven anecdotal evidence suggests that users often find interesting and useful information without purposefully application of information searching skills and strategies. So I'm sure you've all been in a situation that you encounter something that is relevant that you were not necessarily looking for, but that has some importance to your work. Now, a study by Pulse Dottier, 2010, showed that in the context of health information behavior in the media, in the media individuals were more likely to encounter health information than actively seek health information. So this is a study, a survey of 1,000 Icelanders, and he specifically asked them to rate various information searching processes. And there were two important findings that came out of the study. One was that information encountering happened much more often than information seeking. This is in the context of health information. Um, and he also found that those individuals who sought information the most were also the ones who encountered information the most. So again, this is something that has been further developed by work by Borshulam Yaramuren and University of Missouri, and she also emphasizes the relevance of this encountering information in the context of news media. So there's quite a bit of evidence here now coming together that encountering can be an important phenomenon. And um, I'd like to argue, in addition, that this is not only in the context of news, but that that's something that happens a lot on Facebook and Twitter too. So these kinds of environments are rather diverse and multifaceted. So we often tend to find things that we were not really looking for, but rather that you know, they're sort of more pushed toward us. Now, how do we define um, serendipity? So to start out, um, our work on um, serendipity here specifically um, looks at serendipity in terms of um, chance encounters with information, objects, or people that lead to fortuitous outcomes. So we're looking here not at only information, but we're also looking here beyond that at ideas and at people in the context of um, information. And it's really important here to say that um, often serendipity is described um, with regards to discoveries such as penicillin, um, or other kinds of scientific discoveries, but in reality serendipity is not just about those major scientific discoveries, but rather um, it's directly linked also to us encountering things in our environment that are much more mundane 
than perhaps encountering uh, you know, the discovery of, uh, of penicillin. Um, but nonetheless, um, I'd like to say that discovering small pieces of information or ideas can still have a major impact on innovation and creativity um, in these kinds of contexts. Now, what I'd like to do next is to compare three different models um, of serendipity. And specifically here, I focus on Erdoles, uh, Ruben Borkel, and Quanhaza, and Macri and Blanford. Um, these are currently the three most predominant models in the literature that are specifically empirically driven um, in their nature. So what I'm attempting to do is to first describe the model, then discuss the pros and cons for each of the model, and finally compare the, four, the models uh, across a, a number of dimensions. Um, this is work that is currently um, being uh, published in the Encyclopedia of Information Science and Technology uh, to be you know, um, coming out in 2013. Okay, so the first model here um, is by Sander Erdelis from the University of Missouri. This was published in 2004 in the Journal of Information Processing and Management. And what's really interesting about the work of Erdelis is that her research is done in an experimental setting. So what she's done is she's placed participants um, in an experiment where she's asked them to deal with a primary task. So they're looking for information linked to that task. And then within that context, they encounter information that is linked to a secondary task. So she calls that foreground and background problem. And while she's dealing with, while people are dealing basically with the foreground problem, they accidentally, and of course this is manipulated in the context of the experiment, encounter information that could potentially be relevant um, to, to their work. And if we look specifically at her model here, um, you can see that at the beginning, the person is seeking information regarding the foreground problem. All of a sudden, they notice the information that is relevant to something completely different. They stop their primary activity, they examine the new information, they capture that information, and then they return towards the foreground problem. So there's a real switch that is going on from one task um, to another. So now if we analyze the model in more detail um, in terms of the pros and cons, we see that first of all, really important here is that there are different tasks at hand. So an individual is not dealing with a single task at any point in time, and I know that next generation um, I think is very used to multitasking and switching between various environments um, and tasks at the same time. So while you're working on one task, we switch to another task, we examine things, capture information, save it for future use, and then go back to our original problem. Now, in my own experience, what, what often fails is for me the capturing part. So I see something that is really relevant on Twitter, somebody that I want to follow, uh, a research project, and then Later on, I forget about the project, um, and I sort of think, well, was it, there was something relevant, but I can't remember exactly where I saw it or, or how it was linked. So it's, it's in, in my experience, and I don't know how it has been for you, but it, that capturing often is, is problematic. But going back to Erdogan's model, some of the problems with the model, though, is that it wasn't done in a naturalistic kind of environment. So the students themselves, while they were in the experiment, reported that even though they noticed, uh, and this was through interviews after the experiment took place, that even though they noticed the information that was relevant to the background problem, they didn't follow that information because they felt that it wasn't suitable in the context of an experiment at the university to actually do that. So um, Erdeles here says, the event elicitation approaches allow control over the situation in which a chance encounter is evoked, but it has proven difficult to provoke serendipity perhaps because the artificial situations have limited meaningfulness to the participants who therefore lack the deeper involvement that may be required for serendipity. So again, there's a real problem here in terms of how realistic these models are. Um, now second, another problem is that there's little information on the environment. So how does the environment really facilitate the information discovery? So what is it within that environment that we encounter, whether physical or digital, that leads us towards noticing that the information is relevant to follow um, that 
then delete. Um, and finally, um, there's also a, a outcome missing. So we don't know really what is the relevance of the information, how was the information integrated into the foreground problem. So again, there's some limitations in terms of the overall model. Uh, the second model that I'd like to discuss is the one we developed at Western. So this is serendipity in everyday life encounters. And our approach was very different because we read Sander Erdogan's work and we thought, well, how do we get around this problem of the experimental nature of um, the experiment? How can we elicit more naturalistic kinds of um, experiences of serendipity and it was really very challenging to come up with an approach but what we ended up deciding to do at the end was to do um, data mining of blocks and I know you're probably wondering you know how such an approach can even work but we basically went on Google blocks and we did searches so we used natural language processing to come up with a number of queries and through these queries we found stories that people had told about their serendipitous encounters with information, ideas, and objects that, um, that, that they told by themselves. So there was really no inducing on the part of the participants. We had no effect on these stories. And I'll tell you in a minute why that is good and bad. Um, this was published in 2011 in Information Research. And the way that we developed our model is that, um, let's see if this works, great. So we started out with a prepared mind. So we felt that people, as they go through these experiences, they have something that already exists before, that sort of again go back to Erdogan's foreground background problem, that makes them realize the relevance of the information they're encountering. Then they notice that information, so they act, open that information, and then together with the chance encounter, there's a surprise, and finally there's a fortuitous outcome in the information that, um, that they find. Now let's take a look at uh, this model in a little bit more detail. So first of all, in terms of what people found in this naturalistic um, environment, we see that they found items, ideas, information, and persons. So those were the four dimensions that we identify as relevant in terms of the kinds of things people describe. Again, remember, this is naturalistic. It's not representative in any way because it was based on our searches on Google Blogger. Um, again, here you can see the percentages of what was found. So primarily, most of the finds were in terms of items that people encountered. Um, and again, here also relevant is the distinction between the online and the offline environment. So encountering of information happened in both environments. And again, this is described somewhat differently by the individuals in these environments. So here, just to give you a little bit of background in terms of the prior need, um, we found that, again, it does link somewhat to the models of information seeking that we're most familiar with. So there is a prior need or some kind of a problem that exists before that frames the information that is found. Um, and that then leads for people to follow uh, that information. And perhaps one of the most important dimensions was the issue of noticing. So it's that moment when people in some way identify within the environment something that is relevant to what they're doing, they shift their attention and they follow that lead, that perceptual cue um, and of course, this is something that happens a lot when we notice something relevant on, on Facebook or Twitter or social media. And I think that in particular in these kinds of very information-rich environments, that noticing can, can be quite complex because as we're searching, for example, you know, going through hundreds of tweets, um, how do we identify, again, which ones are the most relevant ones and, and how, how do we connect those two ideas that, that we exist? So um, this morning I met with Laurie McPiquet, who's a PhD student here, and we had some very you know, uh, interesting discussions around this issue of noticing and how can you better you know, design environments to, to create that noticing and help the elicitation and the sifting of these massive um, amounts of information. So finally, we have um, the outcome. Again, here, there's a perceived value. There's a solution to a prior problem or new action that comes out of um, this specific encountering with um, new information. Now, in terms of the pros and cons of our model, certainly it is naturalistic in nature. Uh, there's no observation bias. Uh, we've identified a prepared mind. There's some kind of a surprise or emotionality, and there's an outcome uh, linked to it. Um, in terms of some of the problems with the model, again, it doesn't say a lot about how that switch happens between the foreground and the background problem. Um, it doesn't deal very much with 
How is that lead investigated? So how does the noticing happen? Um, and there's also little information about how the environment triggers uh, the noticing. So this is the final model that I want to talk about today. So this is uh, Macri and Blandford's model there at UCL. Uh, this is a Journal of Documentation article 2012. Now if we look at their model, um, perhaps what, what is most distinct from the other two models that I've presented is this idea of uh, the connection. So a lot of their model really emphasizes more what is happening at the cognitive level. So again, the other models, uh, some of the emphasis was really on this noticing and the interaction with the environment as we notice important information. This model here has much more the focus on this aha moment. So it's the moment when a scientist or a researcher or just you know, an everyday person sees something that is relevant and, and makes a new connection between things that were previously disconnected. And, and I think that that's something that is a little bit more complex to study because, again, um, a lot of that making the connection is something that really happens at a very high level, whereas the noticing, I think, is something that happens much more at the environmental level. So, again, it, it's very important to notice the distinction between this model in comparison to some of the others. Um, and I per I, perhaps I should mention here that the work of Macri and Blanford was based on interviews. So they did um, a number of interviews with scholars, with scientists, and based on those interviews, they developed their model. So maybe that also can explain a little bit the distinction in terms of, of the findings and that it's very much sort of research um, oriented. So again here, in terms of the, the positive sides of this model is really this active engagement with information of the person as they notice the relevant information, they make sense of that information, they create new connections, um, and they fit that information into existing knowledge and problems, so they exploit the connection. Um, really relevant here is the outcome, so in terms of what kinds of new discoveries um, could be made. Now, in terms of the cons, perhaps, of the model, it is primarily the lack of, you know, how does the environment play a role here? Um, how does the environment facilitate the discovery of information? What is the role of the pre prepared mind um, and, and the surprise? So just to wrap up then with my first part of the presentation, this is the framework that we're currently developing that has a number of the features um, that are relevant across um, all of the models here on the left and then compares each of the models across those features. And I'd like to just point out maybe a few things. Um, this is a little bit overwhelming, I know, so I apologize for that. But perhaps what's important is that across the only dimension that is relevant across all of the models is noticing. So there must be something about that noticing of relevant information that regardless of whether you're studying scientists or you're studying people in everyday life, really makes an enormous difference. Um, the second thing that I'd like to point out, and we were discussing this with Laurie this morning, is the role of the environment. So you can see how the role of the person and the role of the environment really plays no role at all in any of these models. And I think this is where there's really a lack of understanding in terms of, well, how are digital environments eliciting or helping, helping or facilitating this kind of discovery of new knowledge of information, or are we really just being narrowed down into an information search? So it's the difference between finding, you know, with retrieval being very precise and high in relevance, and retrieval being more expansive. So why does serendipity matter? So I mean, I've identified here a number of things. Um, I think serendipity. And again, it depends on how you specifically define serendipity, but I think that it is linked to things like resource discovery, um, exploration, uh, creative thinking, thinking of the, of outside the box, um, you know, dealing with the intersection of fields. And, and, and my sense is that this is going to be more and more important as both organizations and academia push towards interdisciplinarity. So I mean, I think interdisciplinarity is in itself in part trying to elicit that serendipitous connection of previously unrelated ideas. So another question that I'd like to explore next is, well, can we design for serendipity? So are, are there instances where um, we can create systems, um, information systems, display systems that can help in one way or another 
the elicitation of new kinds of discoveries. And again, here, if we go back to many of the models of information seeking that deal with the digital environment, um, we will find the same problem as with the early models I, that I described of information search. So um, again, here are two models that I'm just sort of very quickly providing an overview with. But if you look at them, both of them, again, neglect this idea of both exploration and expansion of resource discovery. So again, it's all about this very much um, sort of facilitating direct search and problem solving. Now, in part, um, the, you know, the results come out of frustration with current systems. So this was very well articulated in the TED talk by Ellie Pariser. Some of you may be familiar with it. Well, he addresses specifically the filter bubble. So one of his key arguments then here is that based on our profile um, on past search behaviors, um, information systems today, such as Google, will present information that they think is relevant um, for us. Um, and of course, that in and of itself, um, I think, can be very problematic. And they sort of say, well, serendipity and personalization are, in fact, two sides um, of the same coin. And um, Google CEO Eric Schmidt has been trying to push towards the development of a serendipity engine. So for him, trying to use profile information to enhance search through serendipity seems like a very important uh, kind, kind of um, um, endeavor. However, Goop already in 1997 said, well, can we even, can we design for that? Can we create those instances in, in digital environments? And out of his frustration, he said, one day I will produce a computer virus and introduce it into my own desktop so that when my sons put in their keyword, say salamander, the screen will erupt in a brilliant but random array of maps and illustrations and text that will divert them from their task. Oh, hey, um, I don't know if this is moving us into the right direction either. Um, but a number of big questions emerge. So exactly what is serendipity? Exactly what are we aiming to design for here? And what are the kinds of um, outcomes uh, that you know, we're, we're trying to get? So there's a number of different tools that exist. Um, some of you may be familiar with that. For example, Banana Slug. Um, Clever Sense, which was recently acquired um, by Google. And again, if we look at all of these tools together, um, I think that we can see that they um, attempt to enhance certain aspects of these serendipity models. So we have a paper at the, in the I conference uh, of this year where we specifically analyze a series of these tools and try to map them onto the serendipity models to see, well, what exactly are they trying to facilitate? Is it the chance encounter with information um, or is it more the noticing um, or what kind of element of uh, serendipity is being um, enhanced here? So for the final part of my lecture of today, I'd like to go into the digital scholar and just very briefly say a few things about the link between a digital scholar and perhaps serendipity, discovery, creativity, um, and innovation. So ultimately, universities and research centers are among the largest organizations in the, wor in the world that cross fields and cultures. Understanding how innovation and productivity are linked in these kinds of high-intense and time-pressured environments is key. So what makes for innovative uh, research? Um, are there ways in which, you know, in collaboration, serendipity can play uh, more of a role? And I think that some of the larger networks, such as Grant, in which, you know, some of us are, are participants in, the idea is to somehow design for that serendipity um, through the creation of the collaborative environments um, themselves. And, uh, so, I mean, again, things like academia.edu and so on also further contribute to creating those connections that perhaps uh, didn't exist um, before. So one of the studies that we currently um, are, are doing and just um, finished uh, now has to do with serendipity in historians and how historians and other humanists are becoming digital uh, humanist. So this was just accepted in JASIS, uh, that's a journal of the American Society for Information Science and Technology, and it will come out in 2013. Um, in, in 
So what we argued here is that historians are an important group to study because they have a close relationship to the book as a research tool, but also as an academic goal. They have a good relationship with the library, and they have positive attitudes um, towards uh, technology. So our key findings um, around serendipity were that um, scholars are worried that there is a loss of serendipity in these digital environments, that research tools and search tools are a black box, and that one of the things that worries them the most is those objects, those things that have not been digitized. So often what is difficult when you're doing a search is not finding out what you're finding, but it's knowing what you can't find. So it's all of that which is unknown that may be relevant, but that we can't access, that that is often problematic. So there's a whole universe out there that most of us usually don't think about because search is so problem-oriented, but that in reality, we may want to know about, we just don't know that we don't know kind of thing. I, I know it's kind of complicated here. Let's just don't become too philosophical. Um, but, but, but I think one of the things that these scholars uh, are telling us is that they, they're aware of the fact that we cannot evade digitization. I mean, and I think that that's a fact in all fields. Um, but they're looking toward new digital tools, new visualization methods, and push technology that can help them navigate that huge amount of data that is available. So those of you who are a little bit familiar with the digital humanities, digital humanities, I mean, in part, the goal is big science. So the ideas are here about, well, how can we explore large amounts of data and make sense of them? But I think that in order for us to reach that point where big science big, yields big results, we need to have those tools between the user and the data that will allow the user to basically explore and make sense of uh, that information. Now, here's one quote from one of our participants, and basically he, he or she is saying that th there is a real problem with moving simply from an environment that is very physically driven for these historians to an environment that is digitally driven where you know, there's no real comparison uh, between uh, the two environments. And I I'm currently um, also uh, facilitating in part um, Library and Archives Canada move towards a digital world because it's, it's, it's extremely challenging for some of these organizations to move towards being in these research intensive digital environments and to at the same time fulfill the needs of scholars that continue to want to have access to the actual um, document. Um, so some of the recent developments here um, include things such as, you know, and these again are very simple systems you might also be interested in or expansions or recreations of physical environments. So again, some of the libraries um, at Windsor um, have the stocks represented digitally that allow basically for that very physical kind of um, visual exploration of the environment in now in a virtual uh, uh, world. Um, again, this is a project by Tim Sherratt and, and it links again to big data, big science. They have uh, digitized um, a lot of the um, archival records of immigrants to Australia and now they're building these infrastructures that mediate between the digital content um, and, and the user themselves. Finally, where, where is this research moving in, in, in the future? Um, currently, we're developing a number of studies where we're looking more at serendipity in these kinds of uh, social media environments. So one of our studies, for example, looks at Twitter and how we can understand within these kinds of and very fast-moving environments how hashtags and handles and back channels both help us find information in people. And I think this is a, a very complex link here because sometimes people lead to information and information lead to people. So there, there's a really interesting interplay between uh, those two, two things. Um, and the, the other thing that we're really interested in is also, well, how can we think of the physical places that help and recreate serendipity to move into the digital places? So again, here, simple things like the way Steve Jobs designed his work environments was such that everybody had to 
come together at a central place within the work setting and that the bathroom was right in the middle there so there's really no way people could evade each other and I think that sometimes these very simple designs can really help in facilitating unexpected um, encounters. I think they're having more fun than we're having here. Um, I'll come up with some more jokes for, for my next presentation on serendipity. So just to conclude then, there's a move away from linear approaches to more emphasis on discovery and browsing of information, people, and resources. Um, we're trying to provide users with what they don't know that they may need or want. Um, and we're trying to achieve alternative forms of presenting, contextualizing, and visualizing information, for example, by social circles and um, by algorithms. So again, I want to thank everybody for your attention. And these papers are all on my website. So if you go to sociodigital.info, um, they're downloadable for free, or also academia.edu. And if you have any questions, um, I look forward to chatting with you after the talk, or send me an email, a uh, tweet. Um, I, I look forward to, to seeing you in any one of those environments. I assume you're going to accept questions right now. Oh, of course. Okay, so, <laughs> so questions for Dr. Kwan Hasa. regardless of you know, whether in the context of her study that was the case or not. Um, and to me, that is uh, one of those points where design can prove um, how we discover and encounter information and create those connections. Because perhaps, you know, I, I'm saying capturing is one of those things that for me is often the, the biggest problem. And so if we had ways of just dragging things, you know, and, and, and I have said during my PhD, I created a folder called Future Project because you know, I was being just getting distracted. And so I think having something like that where you can say future information. Um, but I think that anything we have at the moment is still very rudimentary. Um, and again, I, I, I always dream you know, of these systems that are sort of part of your brain, sort of Google kind of glasses, where um, these things can be captured, but where they will tell you later on that they're relevant again. So I mean, I think we're really very far from creating those kinds of models, but, but I think that things, I mean, as we discussed earlier, like alerts and, and, and so on, can, can really help with that capturing and making sense, because we may be missing out on a lot of things that are important by rushing too much and, and not following those leads that sometimes could be con considered distraction. Um, and interruptions. And I mean, in a lot of my work that I did with students, 
what we looked at was whether student conversations over the same message on Facebook add distractions to their actual work. So, I mean, the primary task is to work, and they're going to talk more all over friends. And I think what we concluded is that, I mean, there has to be a balance, because some of those things are social capital, are, are, are other t intangible kind of assets that are so difficult that may not be linked to the primary task. Okay, other questions? Yes, I was actually um, interested just in following up what you were saying about capturing. Um, so has anyone to date um, tested whether if you just gave people a little box that said, you know, capture for later, you know, important stuff for later, uh, do people use it? Okay, so the question is, for the recording is, is there a little black box to <laughs> put all the sorts of things you want to capture in? Has anyone tried that? Yeah, I don't know. Does anybody know? No, yeah, I was just very interested because I've been uh, looking at groups of students and how they behave. And I was almost thinking that they needed some kind of black box that said, this is really important, don't lose it. Because, you know, in, in the, the to and fro of group conversations, things do get lost. So I'm thinking we need a lot of things. No, and, and I, I think you're making a, a really good point. And I think what's so difficult when we're working on something, we're very intensely working on it foreground problem is that often um, we need to make a decision quickly about whether we get distracted or not. And of course we don't know whether those distractions are contributions or not. But I mean I think what I've learned is that I mean for example in the context of academia but also in the context of work and innovative teams, um, talking to people is such an important component of the work we do, yeah. even though it's not intangible. Um, because that's where we get a lot of those ideas that are outside of what we would normally follow. So, I mean, I think most of us as academics have had that experience where we're at a conference, we meet someone, we chat, and at the end of two hours and some wine, we've got a new project. So, I mean, of course, the question is, well, is that really somebody or not? And I, and I think to some extent, my conclusion would be it doesn't really matter. And the point is that you're exploring new resources, and if you see a, a person, another person has that information, rich information rich resource, that is not about happening with your own, then clearly that can lead you toward new directions. And I, I just wanted to tell one funny story yeah. that I realized when we were talking about the capturing, that apparently I capture a lot of things and, and don't realize I do, so I go home after working on my thesis all day, and the kids are doing something, and I say, oh, do you know that you should be getting an hour of exercise a day? And they say, how do you know that? And I say, well, because when I was working today, I read, so apparently I've been relating all these articles to the extent that my children are now asking me if I do anything at work. <laughs> So, you know, it is interesting when you think about it, because I'm capturing all kinds of apparently random things and storing it somewhere. Well, and that's very well with the Yamashora and also the festive work on yeah. the Icelanders, because I think what they're saying is that we have so many things that are relevant to our life mm -hmm. and so many different dimensions, different paths we wear. Exactly. So that we may be reading the newspaper and finding out information about things that we weren't even looking for. Mm -hmm. Of course, that makes total sense to us. But but in reality, is that that encountering, at least in the context of health information, seems to be so much more relevant than any kind of act of speaking that we would be doing. Because we probably don't have time to do all that act of speaking, or we may not even know what we're looking for. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, the question to you last there. Hi, Annabelle. Um, I'm wondering if you find it fascinating, actually, as a reference librarian, many things go off. The digital scholars, what I'm wondering about is this act of noticing. I wonder if prior, I mean, obviously prior experience plays into the act of noticing. But to what extent would digital scholars versus students versus Icelanders versus uh, street people, mm -hmm. you know, at the coffee shop, would their noticing be different? Because, you know, I, I would argue information people, of whom digital scholars are a very serious group of experts, have higher tuning on noticing. And what kind of difference does that make? And what difference might it suggest about tools and spaces and places and how are you reflecting that in your model? Mm -hmm. 
That's a very long question. That's okay, but it's all around the question of noticing. Yes. And is there variation across the spectrum of people? Types of, yes. yes. And expertise. Yes. Well, I think there, there are two things. One is that the work of Jenica Heinstrom um, deals specifically with that. And even though she did, I mean, as far as I remember, she didn't find too many correlations with personality traits. I think there are some few, I think extroversion is the one that links the most toward this. So maybe there are people that are a bit more extroverted that are also seeking more information and also encountering more information in general. Um, and I think that in the case of scholars though, and I think this would apply more in general across all groups, but I think in the case of scholars specifically, um, history scholars th themselves rely on serendipity. And I mean that's something that is already documented in literature, it's not something we found. I mean we, we found it in our study, but, but the reality is that for them that serendipitous encounter is perhaps one of the most important components of the research process. And again, if you think of historians, and I mean, most of us may not you know, be close to being to the work of historians, but there's a huge difference between primary and secondary sources for them, which doesn't exist really for access to information scientists. But for them, finding that one primary source that contains a letter of you know, Maria Magdalena or someone can really completely change the direction of their research. So that is really what makes them so active noticers, is that they're going into those archives with the hope of encountering something, and they may have something somewhat specific in mind, but they're very open to finding something totally different. Whereas other scholars are less so, I think. Other scholars are more, although maybe less so, maybe in the PhD, while well, you're starting in the PhD, um, and, and, and that's something, again, that the literature also says, is that Search is more half a service at the beginning of a project, and then it becomes much more search oriented. So maybe at the beginning of problem solving, we're more willing to explore different directions, but the more advanced we're in the project, the more we know exactly what we need to find, kind of thing. I don't know if that's Other questions for Dr. Plonhouse? I have one for you. You said the, on your comparison of the models that people and environments for the things that were sort of missing. Mm -hmm. yep. So uh, you've now just, in response to this question, um, uh, talked a bit about people, because there's a spectrum of possibilities there. Um, everyone is unique to some extent, but the question is more around environment. How are you going to incorporate environment into your model? The environment, <laughs> the environment could be quite different. Yeah. Um, or are you going to try? Well, Laurie and I talked about this extensively this morning, and um, I, I think, I mean, there are various approaches that are currently ongoing in, in the literature. Um, and Kim Martin, who's sitting next to Laurie, I mean, she's, uh, she worked on a, on a model where basically she tried to create um, a Q&A system that will help through the scholar engaging with the system, you know, create uh, a, a larger environment for, for encountering um, information. But, but I think that there are a number of different approaches one can follow, because Lori, you're more looking at, well, trying to identify things in the environment that could potentially help toward understanding that environment better. Um, so I think that that's certainly a first important step, is to just sort of find, well, what is it an environment that people are doing to encounter that information. And I mean, the noticing is very much at the perceptual level, but I think there's an interaction clearly ongoing with how the environment presents information. And for example, realistically, Google is not really the best kind of environment for discovery of information to happen, um, simply because of the way that it's structured. But most of our research shows, and I'm sure you're all familiar with that, is that people go first and foremost to Google for information, so do scholars. So maybe there is quite a bit of work that could be done in that very simple interface to introduce more dimensions by which one can access information. Sorry, to, uh, just one other thing I was thinking about and noticing as you're talking 
is, is time, as you just mentioned. So I didn't see time on the list here, but it does, you know, just from what you've been saying, uh, time in terms of when, you know, beginning of a project versus end, time might be an element that we have to really consider when we're looking at then. Okay, so the question is, does time factor into serendipitous discovery? I think time factors in, in, a, in a number of different ways. Um, and it's not very well reflected in the models either because sometimes information that we encounter right now, we may not realize how important it is until later. So if we can go back to that information, that's really good. It's the same as with people. I mean, you may meet someone, they tell you about the research at the time, you may say, yeah, that sounds really interesting. And then months later you're thinking, oh, I remember I met this person, maybe I should contact them because that's really relevant to what I'm doing now. So, so I agree with you, but, but I think it's very hard to, con to theorize time. It's just um, really difficult to build that into these kinds of models because you know, it can be very short. And it's the same with the fortuitous outcome. I mean, a project that, and I remember reading Connie Gerser's work on that when she was doing her PhD years ago. She described how she was studying these group processes and nothing of what she had theorized worked and she just was going to give up her PhD. Um, when all of a sudden it turned out that that was a major discovery in terms of how groups worked over time. So then again, something that at some point may be a bad outcome could be a fortuitous outcome later on in the process and that makes it more complicated. So. Okay, sorry, I, I missed the first half of your lecture, so I'm, I'm not sure if you have an answer to the question that I have. So my question is, do, do you distinguish between you know serendipitous discoveries done while you're actively searching for something or were you not searching for something? For example, when I'm writing a paper for an inequality class day, I come across an article and put it down in my you know project for very folder. And when I'm not doing, doing that, like you know, when I'm not writing a paper, I go on Google and search them, then something might come up. Like, is it more likely to have serendipitous discoveries while you're looking for something versus you were just browsing? Mm. So the question is, when does serendipity occur? <laughs> yes, well, I mean, I think that that's basically, it's, it's very hard to say when it is more likely to, to occur, because it could happen at any point in time, basically. Um, it could happen both while you're browsing or while you're searching. But, but I think that the point here is just that sort of interlinking of ideas, because what I'm thinking is you may be browsing just for fun and find something linked to your course, probably very unlikely, but, um, but again, you may be searching something for your course on inequality, and all of a sudden you may find something that is relevant for something completely different personal. So again, it's that interlinking of environments and, and things that you're encountering that, that is really the relevant. Um, and again, going back just to the definitions of serendipity, um, I think that some of the definitions are very narrow and focus specifically on chance, com something being completely random. And I, I don't think that that's where most of the work in the literature is going today. I think that it's going more towards research discovery and encountering. So, so I think that what, what I'm trying to say here is that, for example, what we found in our model was that when people are on the internet searching or browsing, they're searching for X and they may find something linked to X and they often describe that as serendipitous. And you sort of wonder, well, why would they interpret that that way? And I think it's something to do with the control of the environment. So the more control you have over the environment, the less likely you are to think that something is serendipitous. But the lower the control of the environment, the more likely you are to find something as serendipitous. So I know this is confusing for 5.30 or 6 in the afternoon. <laughs> but I mean, basically there's something about how you interact with the environment that really matters as to whether you think that the information encounter was accidental or not. And, and often on searches, if you think about it, what we're searching on the web, at least you know, the people we interviewed have very little control over that environment. So you're sort of browsing, you're jumping from one link to another, and then when you find something that is really relevant, all of a sudden you sort of think, wow, how could I have found this really relevant piece in this sort of juggernaut kind of information environment? And, and that's what makes it so relevant to people.
Exactly. That's that okay? that's, that's and, and that's really I mean that finding it on an unexpected place, sometimes people interpret that as something. Um, would it also count if it's like if it's not if you're say you're searching for something really specific and then you come across something else that totally distracts you but it is of another topic of interest and then you kind of set aside for later and is that would that be considered characteristic as well? Or just kind of well, off track and no, it's distracting. <laughs> What's the difference between serendipity and distraction? <laughs> <laughs> and th that is where a lot of our work is focusing on right now is on exactly that. And, and I think that, that the point that you're making is really critical because um, I think that sometimes when we're working, it's very important for us to remain focused. I mean, I'm sure that anybody who's doing a PhD knows, you know, that. Probably that's the one thing that will get you through the PhD is being focused. But so I mean, so determining when to stay focused and when to follow a lead and when is something relevant is quite tricky. But if you look at the model here, the way we define it at least was that anything that's a distraction would not fall under certain because it didn't lead to that outcome. So okay, right. basically, it is when you're making that connection, and that connection then has some kind of an outcome. And I guess the outcome is very basic to find. It can just be something simple like changing your activity, or somebody told you about a yoga club, you by accident ran into somebody who told you about a yoga club, you went to the yoga club, now you're doing yoga. Well, that's sort of a positive kind of outcome. If it did happen somewhat by chance, and you were not looking actually to join the yoga club. So, again, and, and that's why in some of these models, and if you look at Macri's model, again, I, mean, I don't want to become too theoretical here, but um, reflect, if you look at here, reflect value of outcome, he really, in his model, really puts very strong emphasis on that sort of evaluation that happens after you encounter the relevant information and it became positive in your life. So it's this sort of retelling, retelling of the story that makes part of we identify it as so it so it has to be something that's so valuable that you kind of want to tell people about it after. And if you look at our model, again, it was based on exactly that notion. Like the only reason why we found those stories on blogs was because people had had that experience and they felt that it was valuable enough to share it on blogs. Otherwise, it was not important. So we were looking for words like unexpected, unanticipated. Um, yeah, sure, we have sort of a list that, that we came up with, but, but it was basically those words that trigger us to identify the story. And one of our key um, criteria for analyzing the story as part of our corpus was that, that they had to have the propitious outcome. So if there wasn't a propitious outcome, we did not include it in our corpus because we felt that then you encountered information but nothing happened. Like there was sort of the distraction kind of thing that it, it can be good to get distracted once in a while, but it doesn't lead really to anything. Um, and again, what that anything is, I think is really important because as I said earlier, most of the research today has focused on penicillin on really big discoveries. But the reality is that I think it often happens on a much smaller scale as we interact in work settings, work environments, with colleagues. And then often these encounters lead to small changes in something that do, even though it may not be always a high risk of cover. Okay, any further questions? Yes. Well, so the question that builds on the point you're making about retelling, retelling is like a really So how do you untangle the comments of someone from the very strong That's why I think when when we look at it, it's one thing is the cognitive part, which is really what is going on in the person's head. 
And I mean, if you look at scientific discovery, I think a lot of the focus there is on the how moment. So it's on this instant where you're making a connection between two ideas or you're putting something together that wasn't together before, and that that sort of is a breakthrough, you know, because that those are things that were previously unconnected. But of course, what we're dealing here with in the digital environment is a lot more simple than that. It's not about a retelling of a story. It's just simply about bombarding you with new things that you weren't expecting. Um, so I totally agree with you. I mean, I think that there's certainly a component there in, in, in the research where the retelling of the story, that the way that we study these things, has a cultural component that may be stronger in some cultures than in others. Um, but having said that, though, I, I think there's something to be said about you know, research discovery that is still very real, that, that, that can happen regardless of, of, of the culture or how we do it, that, that has to do with complete information and how we cover it more. Any last questions? Yes. Uh, um, you mentioned that uh, can you perceive that the digitization of the environment can be a loss of serendipity? Um, serendipity obviously occurs uh, in the digital world as well as um, outside the digital world. Do rates of serendipity drop in the digital world um, versus finding things in the real world? Well, th I think that would be a great study. If you could have some kind of a comparison of people looking for information digitally and set that up versus the physical, I think that, that would give us quite a few insights. Um, so far, most of the work that I can think of um, is based on very much attitudes and perceptions. So how people perceive these environments and how they affect the, their work. Um, I haven't really seen anything that, that does such kind of direct comparison. Um, and I think it may be really difficult just because of, of the size of things. But having said that, one, one thing that is really important that I think often our participants forget that we've noticed in the interviews is that they sort of see the physical world as being somewhat random. So our historians, for example, describe how they go to the stacks and they look at books and while they're searching for book X, they encounter books Y, Z, and how relevant that is and how serendipitous that is. But in reality, if you think about it, books are organized. They're not randomly put on shelves, but they're organized by groups, they're organized in some meaningful way. So if you're looking for surveillance and for a book on surveillance, you're in the surveillance section, there may be other books there that catch your attention and that could be potentially relevant. Um, so I think that that's why it becomes tricky in how people perceive things. I think some of it may be familiarity. So they're so familiar with working with these physical environments that when they move digitally, they perceive it as, as a loss of, of, of that. And that's why a lot of these new systems recreate the physical environment. And I'm not sure that that's the best way to go about it. Like I somewhat question that. I think that there may be additional methods of representing the information. But at least now, I think most of the attempts are to recreate the physical environment so that there's this familiarity again and hopefully also the experience of serendipity or, or, or research discovery. So maybe there will be a day, uh, Annabelle, when we'll record everything digitally about ourselves. <laughs> and so we just pose a query to our own digital self. Yeah. And <laughs> I'd like to ask Amy Lawrence, uh, the uh, co-chair of the Students Association, now to come and speak. I would like to thank Dr. Anubhav khan for this interesting and enlightening lecture this evening. The serendipitous way we accidentally encounter information is always interesting to me. Browsing in the stacks in the library for my undergrad studies was how I discovered some of my best sources, resulting in some of my most successful research cases. Um, browsing online and surfing on the web for information leads to blog posts, user comments, and links to information relevant to us that we may not have located otherwise. The availability of vast quantities of information may impede serendipitous discovery, however. Your lecture has outlined important research on this topic. On behalf of the School of Information, I wish to present you with this modest gift and a bit of Nova Scotia by way of thanking you for this lecture.
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the lecture this evening. Uh, there is a flyer here to uh, alert you up to the next student series. If you wish to take a copy with you, please do so on your way.